sitting on a dusty bookshelf at my local library was an encyclopedia of the paranormal. The mysterious cover on it attracted me. I grabbed it from the bookshelf and leafed through it, looking at all the illustrations of alleged aliens, Bigfoot, and the Loch Ness Monster, of course. But I stopped at one particular illustration that carried with it a colorful name. The drawing was of a fiendish looking man with a cape and some bizarre looking shoes. He was standing atop a wall with onlookers on the ground looking up at him in anticipation of what would be his next move. Something about this drawing caught my attention. A lure of mystery and of Victorian England came to mind. I was about 13 years old when I found this book and saw this illustration. The drawing was of an alleged paranormal phantom character named Springheeled Jack. Look up the phrase Springheeled Jack in a Google search and you will return somewhat old looking drawings of a tall, thin, devilish looking character. The phenomena of Springheeled Jack could be placed alongside other ghostly, fiendish, but physical characters such as Jack the Ripper, the London Monster, and the Mad Gasser of Mattoon. You could even extend the comparison of spring Jack to include figures such as the Jersey Devil and, of course, the Mothman. The basic story of the character is that during Victorian-era England, there were multiple sightings of a phantom assailant that was nicknamed spring Jack. He received this nickname since he apparently could leap very high, as if he had springs on his heels. He used this ability to get away from authorities trying to capture him after appearing and at times physically harming those he sprang upon, so to speak. But aside from a supernatural leaping ability, those who caught a glimpse of the shadowy fiend also said that he had clawed hands and carried with him a demonic, diabolical countenance that brought forth fear from those unlucky enough to see him. As we've seen, those that happened to see the figure believed it to be a male. Springtail Jack could more aptly be labeled a mystery assailant and mystery assailants were a common feature in societies throughout the world. Think of any unfortunate series of events that involve a person attacking another person or group of people, and then getting away, and doing this multiple times. But for the character of Spring Hill Jack, the series of encounters slash attacks, some more memorable than others, have to this day not been solved. In a sense, this close to 200 year old case has morphed into include paranormal elements aside from an obvious physical component. Does the lack of a true identity to the mysterious spring Jack figure make a stronger case for more paranormal, anomalous roots to this shadowy entity and to his story? Let's take a closer look now at this urban boogeyman character, as well as at some more detailed descriptions of frightening encounters with the figure. The basic well-told story goes something like this. In London, starting in the year 1837, a mysterious individual was reported as having physically attacked a servant girl named Mary Stevens as she was walking near Clapham Common alone at night. Mary stated that this lone assailant jumped out of the dark and grabbed her tightly, then tried to kiss her and rip her clothes off. Her assailant, in the frenzy of the moment, had scratched her body with what apparently were claws on its hands. As Mary thrashed in pushing away her attacker, she screamed and yelled, which luckily drew the attention of a passerby that evening. That's when her assailant, who Mary could still not visibly identify clearly due to the darkness around South London that evening, literally performed a superhuman leap and got away before the passerby came to Mary's aid. And at that moment, the mythos of Spring Hill Jack was born. There are many, many encounters with Spring Hill Jack written about in Victoria and post-Victorian English publications. It is widely considered that the encounter with Mary Stevens was the first time that an encounter with the entity was widely publicized. Without reviewing each encounter for physical attributes of the figure, this is what Spring Hill Jack is typically described as, both physically and behaviorally. A male, due to the sheer physical strength that he imposes on those he appears to, and also based on his frequent attacks on females, he wears a black cloak and underneath the cloak would be a tight-fitting white garment. This white garment, eyewitnesses report, reminded them of an oilskin, i.e. a raincoat like the one Georgie wore in Stephen King's It. But the one worn by Spring Hill Jack was tight-fitting and worn underneath a black cloak, made of probably some type of wool. 
His facial features exuded terror and fright, hence the nickname Spring Hill Jack, the Terror of London. His facade was tall and thin, with at times appearing, you could almost say, like a gentleman. But his eyes gave away his alleged true nature. Two eyes, glowing red eyes, that resembled red balls of fire. On top of his head, he wore a black helmet, and when he wanted to, could breathe out blue and white flames while attempting to grab his next victim with his long, clawed fingertips. And last, but not least, there is that superhuman leaping ability of his. He can allegedly jump over entire houses, walls, and even buildings. This is how he apparently makes his escape after one of his attacks. This summarized description of spring Jack sounds more like the Mothman, but without the ability to fly like the Mothman was allegedly able to do. But you can say that spring Jack, in his ability to spring or jump long and tall distances, that this incredible leaping ability could almost be seen as flying by observers. This is an interesting parallel, since both the Mothman and spring Jack have been called a type of demon or devil by those that caught a glimpse of the creatures. A London journalist of the era, Henry Mayhew, wrote the following entertaining description of Spring Hill Jack, which appeared originally in the 1840s newspaper, The London Morning Chronicle. This here is Satan, we might say the devil, but that ain't right, and gentlefolks don't like such words. He is now commonly called Spring Hill Jack, or the Rusian Bear, that's in Sogor. Ye since he's chained up forever, or if ye reads, it says somewhere in the scripture, that he's bound down for 2,000 years. I used to read it myself once, and the figure shows, ye, that he's chained up never to be let loose no more. He comes up at the last and shows himself to punch, but it ain't continued long, you know, the figure being too frightful for people to see without being frightened. Unless we are on comic business and showing him a spring Jack or the Rusian bear, and then we keeps him up a long time. Punch kills him, puts him on top of a stick, and cries, Hooray, the devil's dead, and we can all do as we like. Goodbye, farewell, and it's all over. But the curtain don't come down, cause we haven't got none. Equating spring Hill Jack, both in appearance and behavior to the Mothman, to a demon or a devil, will be discussed more in detail later on in today's episode. There are two primary historical encounters with spring Hill Jack that cemented his place in British Fortiana alongside characters like Jack the Ripper, the Halifax Slasher, Sweeney Todd, and the London Monster. There were many encounters, however, with the Fiend after the initial attack on Mary Stevens in 1837. The first encounter of note is one that took place a year later, in 1838, in the town of Bow in East London. Bow is about nine miles northeast of the site of the Fiend's original attack near Clapham Common. The attack in Bow would take place on February 19th to Jane Alsop, a young woman who lived with her father and two sisters on Bearby Lane on the outskirts of the village of Old Ford in Bow. The following was reported in the London Times. Miss Jane Alsop, one of the young ladies, gave the following evidence. About a quarter to nine o'clock on the preceding night, she heard a violent ringing at the gate in front of the house, and on going to the door to see what was the matter, she saw a man standing outside, of whom she inquired what was the matter. The person instantly replied that he was a policeman and said, For heaven's sake, bring me a light, for we have caught Spring Hill Jack here in the lane. She returned to the house and brought a candle and handed it to the person, who appeared enveloped in a large cloak. The instant she had done so, however, he threw off his outer garment, and applying the lighted candle to his breast, presented a most hideous and frightful appearance, and vomited forth a quantity of blue and white flame from his mouth, and his eyes resembled red balls of fire. Miss Alsop added that she had suffered considerably all night from the shock she had sustained, and was then in extreme pain, both from the injury done to her arm and the wounds and scratches inflicted by the miscreant on her shoulders and neck, with its claws or hands. This story was fully confirmed by Mr. Alsop, and his other daughter said that the fellow kept knocking and ringing at the gate after she had dragged her sister away from him, but scampered off when she shouted from an upper window for a policeman. The second historical attack of note would take place nine days later after the Alsop attack on February 28th. 
The second attack would occur to 18-year-old Lucy Scales, a resident of a town named Limehouse, which was situated two miles south of Bow. Once again, the local London Times covered this subsequent attack as well in an issue of the era. The Ghost, alias Springkill Jack, again. At Lambeth Street office, Mr. Scales, a respectable butcher, residing in Narrow Street, Limehouse, accompanied by his sister, a young woman 18 years of age named Lucy Scales, made the following statement relative to the further gambles of Springkill Jack. Miss Scales stated that on the evening of Wednesday last, at about half past eight o'clock, as she and her sister were returning from the house of their brother, and while passing along Green Dragon Alley, they observed some person standing in an angle in the passage. She was in advance of her sister at the time, and just as she came up to the person who was enveloped in a large cloak, he spurted a quantity of blue flame right in her face, which deprived her of her sight and so alarmed her that she instantly dropped to the ground and was seized with violent fits, which continued for several hours. Mr. Scales said that on the evening in question, in a few minutes after his sisters had left the house, he heard the loud screams of one of them, and on running up Dragon Alley, he found his sister Lucy, who had just given her statement on the ground in a fit, and his other sister endeavoring to hold and support her. She was removed home, and he then learned from his other sister what had happened. She described the person to be of tall, thin, and gentlemanly appearance, enveloped in a large cloak, and carried in front of his person a small lamp or bullseye, similar to those in possession of the police. The individual did not utter a word, nor did he attempt to lay hands on them, but walked away in an instant. Every effort was subsequently made by the police to discover the author of these and similar outrages, and several persons were taken up and underwent lengthened examinations, but were finally set at liberty nothing being elicited to fix the offense upon them. The preceding two historical accounts of encounters with Spring Hill Jack got the figure on the phantom map, so to speak. The last historical appearance of Spring Hill Jack was reported as occurring in Everton, a district of Liverpool, in 1904. The local Liverpool press reported the sighting as follows. Considerable commotion was caused yesterday on William Henry Street, Everton on a rumor that a sort of spring Jack was pursuing his antics in that neighborhood. The story, as it was passed from mouth to mouth, reached sensational dimensions. It referred chiefly to the annoyance of the inmates of a certain house by means of various missiles being thrown in a mysterious manner and without any visible agency. The annoyance is said to have been so great that the tenants left the house today, but the police have been unable to find any ground for the suggestion that a ghost was at work, and believe some foolish person has been playing pranks. Then a few days later, the story was picked up by the evening publication, The London Star, which provided additional details. Everton, Liverpool, is scared by the singular antics of a ghost, to whom the name of Springkill Jack has been given, because of the facility with which he has escaped, by huge springs, all attempts of his would-be captors to arrest him. William Henry Street is the scene of his exploits, and crowds of people assemble nightly to see them, but only a few have done so yet, and Jack is evidently shy. He is said to pay particular attention to the ladies. So far the police have not arrested him, their sprinting powers being inferior. But of course, as we've seen with encounters with creatures that apparently were relegated to only the myth and folklore of our ancestors, encounters with the fiend, known as Springkill Jack, have continued to be reported in more contemporary times as well. The following account took place on Westbury Street, Sheffield, UK, in 1973, 69 years after the last historical sighting of the fiend. When we moved into our house in 1973, our neighbors told us to be careful at night because there had been trouble with the prowler. Apparently, he had knocked on windows, punched men, and grabbed women. We were also told this is the reason why there were police cars always parked at the end of the road. One night, I was coming back from town with my new boyfriend when we saw a dark figure slip into one of the alleyways. We were cautious and decided to walk in the middle of the road. Slowly, we walked past the alleyway. Suddenly, we noticed two bright red circles. They came closer, then we realized it was his eyes. We began to run and my boyfriend felt something hit his back. 
He turned around and lying on the floor was a pitchfork type tool, like a hay fork. He picked it up, then we ran home. We contacted the police and a sergeant, Trevor Basendale, came and took the fork away for evidence. The strange thing is he didn't offer any explanation at all for what we saw. And another more recent account of meeting the creature, taking place in southern England in February 2012. Late evening, the Martin family was taking a taxi from Stoneleigh to their home in Banstead, when near the Raygate Road Junction on the Ewell Pass, they saw a fast-moving dark figure with no obvious features dart across the road in front of them. After running across one lane, the figure easily jumped the central reservation fence before crossing over their carriageway and was quickly and effortlessly up and over the 15-foot roadside bank. Naturally, the whole family and their taxi driver were shaken by this seemingly supernatural experience. Their young son was too scared to sleep on his own that night, and the taxi driver voiced his fears of driving back alone. But we also see accounts of encounters with Springkill Jack taking place in other countries as well. The following is a newspaper excerpt describing sightings of the entity, which took place in Santa Fe, Argentina, in March 2005. Numerous local residents have reported to the police encountering or seeing a peculiar character, dubbed the Crazy Man of the Roofs. He is said to jump from roof to roof using uncanny acrobatic ability. Witnesses describe him as over two meters in height, wearing all black, with cape and carrying some kind of walking stick or cane. His eyes are said to glow red when he is confronted by witnesses. Some describe him as some sort of cat man who they could only see in silhouette and conceals his face. But when his face is seen, his eyes are said to be glowing red. He is said to have first appeared in the suburb of Centenario, near a local soccer stadium, and then in the suburbs of El Arenal, San Lorenzo, Chalet, and Santa Rosa de Lima. A resident from El Arenal sector reported that he fired 17 times at the mysterious stranger who seemed totally immune to the bullets. It seemed to provoke or goad the witness by howling like an animal or cry like a baby, jumping from roof to roof like a cat. Many of the locals have armed themselves with clubs and knives. Most of the witnesses describe the intruder as a character out of the comic books, very tall, who is able to leap across streets in a single bound and climb up steep, smooth walls up to seven meters in height. A resident of the city claims she saw the man and it then vanished into thin air. Another woman claims she saw the man point a finger at her, causing her total paralysis. Given the myriad of well-documented historical accounts of encounters with Springfield Jack, in addition to many contemporary encounters with the entity, or at least an entity resembling the original character, why hasn't the true origin of the figure been identified? Why does it remain enigmatic? Let's analyze the evidence now and see if an objective, science-based conclusion could be deduced based on all of the evidence presented in today's episode. As mentioned, the true identity of Springkill Jack was never discovered by investigators at the time of the sightings during Victorian England. However, there was one individual who authorities believe might be the person behind the encounters. His name was Henry Beersford, with title, the Third Marquis of Waterford. Henry was known, what you would call, as a hooligan, who together with his friends, and most probably due to his royal title, felt entitled in being able to go about conducting crude acts of violence and vandalism throughout London. And these were mostly done against women and the police. He and his buddies would walk through the London streets late at night, after an evening of drunkenness, and would knock chaotically on random doors, would knock over household items sitting on porches, and would try to harass and bother women that happened to be outside during that time at night. The most interesting connection between Springkill Jack and Henry Beersford was that Beersford was known as dabbling and also having friends in applied mechanics and design, which would provide the skill sets for creating items such as Springkill boots glowing red orbs for eyes, and of course, a contraption in order to safely spit fire. All of these could be developed in a London physics lab and be used to create the fantastical elements that Springkill Jack 
was known for. However, Beersford died in 1859, long before the attacks by Spring Hill Jack would come to a close. However, Beersford could have given birth to the original idea and the actions behind the character of Spring Hill Jack, and after he died, it could have been continued by copycats. We see the concept of copycats appearing often in serial crime, such as in the case of Eddie Sita, the Zodiac Killer copycat, and of course, Derek Brown, a copycat of Jack the Ripper. But overall, during the shenanigan spree that Henry Beersfoot and friends conducted in London, and also during the possible copycats after his death, no lead on the true identity of Spring Hill Jack was ever found by London authorities. Another concept to consider in analyzing the character of Spring Hill Jack has to do with mass hysteria. In previous episodes of The Paranormal Nothing, we've encountered this type of societal panic when it came to the alleged witchcraft of Jane Winham, the accusation of lycanthropy against Peter Stump, the werewolf of Bedburg, and even in the case of the Varginha humanoids and the panic that ensued in Varginha, Brazil after the initial sighting of the alleged extraterrestrials walking around the city. In London, after the initial sighting of Spring Hill Jack by Mary Stevens, this could have led to mass hysteria or panic, since society in Victorian London was well known for privacy, especially in the middle class. According to English journalist Kate Summerscale, writing in regards to English societal norms during the Victorian era, the English home closed up and darkened over the decades. The cult of domesticity matched by a cult of privacy. Bergois' existence was a world of interior space, heavily curtained off and wary of intrusion, and open only by invitation or viewing on occasions such as parties or teas. So any intrusion, any sense of infiltration into this secluded space could have been seen as a threat to the domesticated privacy that existed in English, particularly in London, society at the time. An increase in alleged sightings followed by the addition of fantastical elements, or at least mundane elements that were described as fantastical due to the panic involved, could have led to a mass hysteria that led an entire London to see the entity of spring Jack around every corner, around every bend, looking to attack and pounce, and more than anything, to scare. In other words, the combination of a very sensible, logical, and private societal norm of living, combined with the trickster elements of whatever spring Hill Jack was, led to the perfect combination of events that could have led to a mass hysteria in London at the time. In regards to the paranormal aspects of the case, there really is not enough evidence, in the opinion of your humble narrator, to give the case any authentic paranormal attributes, since most aspects of what spring Hill Jack was could allegedly do or provoke could be explained by man-made contraptions and events. It seems that the enigma of Spring Hill Jack is more related to who and how many individuals went on to embody the characteristics and actions of the figure, and not so much as to whether or not the sightings themselves were paranormal in nature. But history books do conclude that Spring Hill Jack was indeed a cause of mass panic during Victorian era London, leading to the nickname that was aptly earned by the figure, Spring Hill Jack the terror of London. Thank you for listening, and as always, question everything.